Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Five for Breakfast. We're now in our 14th episode of 2024, and I'm very excited. Today is our sixth episode of our quantum series sponsored by Cubitech to educate our audience on the amazing advancements of quantum technology and quantum networking made possible by fiber broadband networks. Before we kick off, I'd like to thank Wesco, the platinum sponsor of Fiber Breakfast, and I'd also like to thank Cubitech for sponsoring our quantum series. You know, in Washington, there's continued efforts being made by Congress for affordability connectivity program funding to extend the program, which is scheduled to conclude at the end of this month. This week, the Problem Solvers Caucus has endorsed ACP Extension Act. This is a bipartisan group of congressional leaders. So that's good. Hopefully something happens. Also, yesterday, uh, FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel sent a letter to Senate Commerce Chair um, Cantwell updating the committee on the potential negative impacts to the program subscribers resulting from the end of ACP. Efforts are ongoing by the administration to urge congressional leaders to fund the program, but now that the spending bills have passed, carrying the government funding till the end of the fiscal year, it becomes more difficult to find a legislative vehicle for ACP funding to ride on. On a disappointing note, the FCC will vote on April 25th on a democratic proposal to restore the Obama era net neutrality rules, which were repealed by the Republicans in 2017. You know, this is a little disappointing, Jessica. Um, I am very excited that I'll be in San Juan, Puerto Rico on Monday and Tuesday for the Fiber Broadband Association's LATAM Chapters Fiber Workshop. Then I'll fly up to DC for our board meeting on Wednesday and then on Thursday is our second annual Fiber Day in the Hill. On, that's April, Thursday, April 11th. Um, last year we had over 250 members of Congress, staff, the administration, the FCC, NTI, Treasury, Department of Congress, you know, and this year is going to be even better. And the Fire Broadband um, Association's next regional Fiber Connect workshop will be held in Little Rock, Arkansas on Tuesday, April 16th. That's less than two weeks away. Registration for Little Rock is on pace to be our largest regional event yet, so please sign up today before it's sold out. You're not going to want to miss that one. You know, after Little Rock and um, on April 16th, we'll be in Deer Valley in June, Des Moines in September. We've added Calgary, so this will be our first Canadian fiber workshop on October 8th. And then we'll be in Albuquerque on, in November. And of course, our big Fiber Connect 2024 conference is in Nashville, July 28th to 31st. And that is coming together perfectly. So we're really excited about that. It'll be the biggest fiber broadband event in the world this year. That brings us to today's Fire for Breakfast session with uh, Mark Whippage, the CEO of MPW, who will be discussing the potential for commercial quantum networking. But before I formally introduce today's guest, I'd like to introduce David Norris from team who's going to walk us through some housekeeping items. Thank you very much, Gary, and good morning to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, before I go over a few logistics, we'd like to once again thank our platinum sponsor of Fiber for Breakfast, Wesco. And of course, we'd also like to thank Cubitech, our sponsor for this quantum series. Uh, here on Fiber for Breakfast. Uh, now, if everybody would please keep in mind, all participants are in listen-only mode today. Uh, however, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of our conversation. Um, so please do post your questions. You can do so using the question box located within the control panel on the side of your screen. This presentation is also being recorded and will be available on FDA's website within 24 to 48 hours. And you can find the recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. Finally, at the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a brief feedback survey. Please take a moment to do so. We appreciate your input. And with that, I will pass things back over to Gary to once again introduce our panelists today and get us started. Gary. Thanks, David. Good morning. I'm Gary Bolton, President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. Last week on Fiber Breakfast, our guest was FBA's research partner, Mike Render, the CEO of RVA, who discussed what 150 billion in five years and U.S. fiber the home construction means to you. Mike discussed how we're going to have 150 billion in new funding expected to add an additional 59.3 million U.S. homes to be reached by fiber over the next five years. If you missed that, you can go to the FBA website and watch the replay. And today's fiber breakfast session is with Mark Whippich, the CEO of MPW. He's going to be discussing the potential for commercial quantum networking. Mark is the CEO of MPW a leading advisor and startup expert in the quantum technology space with deep combination of expertise in business, technology, 
and connected networks throughout the value chain. He has over 20 years of success, successful corporate development, business development, and marketing leadership in quantum, photonics, electronics, and fiber optic communications with multiple high growth startup wins and exits. Mark is on the front lines with, of the scaling of the quantum ecosystem, advising leading entrepreneurs and their boards, investors, and established companies on quantum 2.0 execution in corporate development and strategy. In addition, he leads and drives various critical quantum initiatives. He leads and moderates the popular QED-C quantum marketplace events. Those are videos on YouTube um, and connecting the world's leading providers and users of quantum technology, including Fortune 500s and startups, highlighting what's available, what's needing, and the path forward. So with all that, welcome, Mark. And for our audience, please type in your questions as we go, and I'll turn things over to Mark. Great, thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much, Gary. Um, so I have some slides here, gonna go pretty quickly. I have a lot of material to cover, um, but let's get into it, the potential for quantum networking. So what is quantum 2.0? I wanna sort of start with that really quick. Uh, it can be a little bit confusing at times. So quantum 1.0 was really, you know, gave rise to say MRI, you know, uh, scanning computers, internet, smartphone, chips. Quantum, quantum 2.0 is, is, is more like closer to nature, right? So it's really about exploiting portions of the quantum mechanics that caused Einstein to state God, is, God does not play dice, you know? It exploits superposition entanglement to build an entirely new generation of quantum technology. And so what does that mean, right? Well, it underlines the most advanced technology of the 21st century because it provides the scientific foundation enables technology more powerful than provided by quantum 1.0. Um, so in terms of the market, you know, what, what does this all look like? There's, a, there's, a, there's many reports on this from top consulting agencies. Uh, I like this one from McKinsey. You know, they're sizing the quantum opportunity as, you know, $100 billion in terms of, you know, the, the ecosystem but even larger, uh, you know, trillions of dollars in potential profits uh, once this all scales out in terms of computing, networking, timing, and sensing. Today we're gonna, of course, talk about networking and, and where does that play. Um, there is a lot of funding, even though it's very, very early in the quantum ecosystem, uh, or the quantum 2.0 ecosystem, there's a lot of money being spent, arguably maybe not enough money, uh, you know, but uh, there is private investment, there is, uh, which is not included on this chart, uh, there's also, you know, big companies, Fortune 500s like Google and Amazon, IBM and others are all spending significant amounts on their balance sheet uh, in these areas. Some, some of these companies are very public about it. Some of them are very secret about it. So, so it's good to keep paying attention to that. Um, so, you know, about 2.5 billion uh, a year being spent in private investment four to five billion a year in governments, so around the world, not just the United States, not just Europe, but Asia uh, and our other parts of the world too. So that's fairly significant. Uh, Gary mentioned this in the intro, but you know, one of the things that I do in terms of uh, helping out the ecosystem and staying on the front lines is the QDC, uh, which is the Quantum Economic Development Consortium funded by the federal government uh, in the United States run out of NIST, uh, and, and it's managed through SRI, uh, you know, essentially is a consortium of members to work together to define standards, to define uh, the various areas of quantum computing, networking, sensing, and timing, and, and sort of, you know, commercializing everything and support and make sure that they're tied to, you know, getting government sponsorship. We have two aspects to this quantum marketplace that we started running about three years ago. One is a directory of member companies it has a, a video icon next to it on the left side here for the ones that have participated. Uh, we've, we've run these, uh, you know, once a month, once every two months uh, for the last three years. It's been very successful uh, and really getting into, you know, where are the areas of commercialization and the member companies, who's selling what today, uh, and what do uh, the customers need, so to speak. On the right side, you can just type in quantum marketplace. Uh, in Google, and you can go to the YouTube channel, it has all our recorded videos there if you want to learn more. I want to give this sort of snapshot timeline here, which is where is all this stuff? It's early, right? But quantum key distribution, many of you may have heard about this. Uh, this, is, this is using uh, quantum 2.0 uh, physics, physics technologies to 
uh, across fiber or in free space, but let's we'll talk about fiber today uh, to pass encrypted keys. Uh, and then we have atomic clocks. Those have been around for a long time, but now what we're talking about is new generations of atomic clocks. Atomic clocks, if you're not familiar, they're used in GPS. They're used in various uh, timing systems for navigation. We're all using, uh, you know, uh, the, the benefit of that timing in our smartphones uh, so that we can get good navigation and et cetera. Planes use that in the, in the sky, uh, et cetera. Quantum measurement, uh, quantum sensors, these are all sort of right in front of us. Uh, they're starting to roll out. Uh, some are getting more and more mature. It's still gonna take some time as that scales out. Um, you know, the unlikely impossible stuff, I'm not gonna spend time on that. You know, that's really where the difficulty and complexity is really challenging. And, and, and there's a lot of things that need to be worked on in terms of the supply chain and the technology. There's a lot of it is still research at this point. But I wanna spend a little bit of time here, which is, uh, it's a bit a bit out and depending on who the player is you know I want to talk about quantum computing which quantum computation you know some will argue that you know very well it already works today that's one of the one of the big misnomers it already works today but it's not economically viable today for, for certain problems it's still more uh, say cost effective to use a high performance uh, computer but we are starting to see these things work on certain use cases and so the idea here is when will these things be powerful enough that they will dramatically, uh, you know, improve a, a, you know, beyond, a, say, a high-performance computer, or a classic computer? Uh, and, and so that's a little bit further out. Um, the key point here with this session today is one of the beliefs that, that my business partners and I believe in is that in terms of use cases, and I'll get, I'll get into this a little bit more, is quantum networking is needed. It's, it's practically the number one use case of quantum networking today is to support scaling quantum computing. And if we think about that, that's what we see in data centers today. That's what we see in the broadband network is we see computers being connected together, right? And so some of these quantum computers that are being worked on today are, uh, you know, they're trying to go, those teams are trying to go as far as they can before they network. So you'll hear that. But some are also saying, look, we need the quantum network today. Uh, and that's going to be through fiber, right? Um, and then longer term, there's also going to be other use cases of quantum networking. I'll get into a little bit more into that uh, in, in a bit. There's also other stuff that hasn't been imagined yet, but has been contemplated a bit, but not really figured out how we would do it. So there's a lot of areas that this could go, right? So in terms of potential use cases, right? So uh, we've got Two that I've sort of contemplated I want to focus on today, which is what are we going to do when quantum computers are so powerful that they can break RSA encryption? That's a scary thought because that sort of challenges the world economy, uh, you know, and how it works, right? So what are we doing about that, right? And, and then the other area is what I just mentioned about distributing quantum computing, and that's sort of connecting these quantum processors together and being able to build a scalable quantum computer that economically works works for the users. And then there's, there's a little bit further out, distributed quantum entanglement. There are people working on that today, um, you know, but it's, it's deemed a little bit further out. Uh, and then there's quantum networks for quantum sensing. That's also, you know, uh, people are working on that today. You could actually, sort of a wild thing to think about here is, these are very sensitive atomic clocks. It could be strung along an earthquake fault connected through uh, quantum qubits and quantum networks, and you could predict earthquakes fairly accurately. So, you know, again, pretty far out there, but uh, in terms of time, but it, it should work. Um, in terms of, you know, maybe getting a little bit more granular into the weeds, so to speak, is quantum networking platforms and subsystems. So, you know, what are we doing about, you know, the, you know, it's talked about a lot in the news is what are we going to do when a quantum computer, what are we going to do about a quantum computer breaking RSA encryption in the future? Well, the first order is, is to develop PQC, which is making quite a bit of progress. Uh, and that's encryption based on uh, quantum computing resistant mathematics. NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and uh, Technology is working on that and leading that up and working with companies that are working on those algorithms and they're testing them all the time. The other thing you can do is QKD, which is a quantum key distribution. The Europeans are very much on that. There's some of that in the United States as well and in, in Asia. 
Uh, that's encryption based on physics, not mathematics. So theoretically, not really hackable, but there's some challenges with that as well. And there's some bandwidth challenges as well, but people are using that in fiber today. Uh, and then there's quantum entanglement for networks and scaling quantum computing as we talked about. And then as we have in classic compute and classic networks, we have memory, we have repeaters, and we have uh, ability to change from say optical to you know ethernet and ethernet back or ethernet cables back to, to optical. Um, and so we're gonna need the same thing in quantum. That is very early too, uh, but very sophisticated physics. Um, anyway, that's my presentation. Thank you. Well, Mark, um, so you know, our, our audience is uh, the fiber industry. And so one of the things I've been very concerned about and the reason that I have this quantum series is as we build out our nation and world's critical broadband infrastructure, how important it is to do on fiber. And can you talk a little bit about the requirements, um, you know, when you were looking at quantum networking and you know, to be able to have fiber networks versus any other technology. Yeah, I, I you know, <laughs> I, I believe in having fiber in our diet. I mean, 100%, right? I think fiber, I've been in this space, I've been in the telecom, datacom space for a long time in the past. Uh, by, the ability to connect through optical fiber has, I think, scale the internet and we weren't going to do that in free space people have been working on free space for a long time free space com or communications and it's important and it's being used in say uh, satellite networks and and that sort of thing but you know inside of a data center uh, i've never seen that scale out i've seen concepts but um, i think fiber is very much part of it i do want to make a comment that i didn't put in my slides uh, that i thought would be very uh, relevant to this audience um you know it's one of these things where, you know, I, I can definitely appreciate like when should somebody get into this market or start paying attention to it? When is it going to become relevant to say your group here? Um, however, there's there's some companies and some big companies that are starting to make movements and, and it's really important to watch this because like, for example, Microsoft acquired a company that does hollow core fiber. Lumicity, right? They did it about a year ago. It's hollow core. It doesn't have a glass core. So what does that mean, right? That that actually has some big implications for not only fiber today, but also quantum in the future because it has less loss. The light travels faster. It uses less power, right? Uh, and so you know that now we're going to have to put that in an infrastructure. And if you put that in a data center, that's easy because they're replacing the, the, the cables a lot, right? Um, especially in the hyperscale data centers, large ones, right? Um, putting into the ground, yeah, that's a little bit tougher, right? But it actually helps quantum networking too. Quantum networking can work in the fiber infrastructure today, um, but uh, there's loss characteristics and other things that have to be mitigated and that can get expensive. Uh, I'll, I'll pinch the question off there. I don't know if you expected me to go in that area, but uh, I think no, the, fiber is I mean, the main thing is I just don't want communities to be left behind because this quantum networking is coming and it's coming quicker. You know, we look at like AI, for example, you know, um, what about five, five quarters ago? No, it never, you know, AI was a distant future. And then chat GBG came off in gangbusters and now, um, you know, AI and, is dominating investment and everything in the you know planet and is, yeah. Yeah. is is it we're ever going to see like a, a domino topple like that for quantum is it just all of a sudden one day be like you know chat gbt and you know taking over the world well i i you know it's a great point right so uh i think quantum was actually overhyped in 19 in 2019 2021 started to level out a bit in 22 and in 23 it, it, it now it's not i would say hyped enough as you said chat gpt took over <laughs> and and we saw we saw ai sort of like make some blips in the past and we knew it was coming but nobody really saw maybe open ai did but but no one really saw what this would you know sort of turn into so fast overnight so to speak right uh, Quantum is a little tougher because quantum uh, includes hardware, right? In terms of like 
laying the hardware out, right, and developing the hardware. Um, and so chat GPT is really, okay, so NVIDIA is really benefiting from that, and there's data centers that are, you know, benefiting from that, uh, but it's really about the software, right? And I well, think- Let's talk about some of the challenges, because, you know, okay. when you think about working at the quantum level, right, I mean, we have to super cool these things to kind of slow the world down at the quantum level, right? But I'm seeing press releases that are saying that we're being able to do some of this quantum technology at um, ambient temperature. So what? How limiting is supercooling in the quantum world, and you know we're going to be able to overcome that? Yeah, sure. So so in certain uh, so I'll use the word modality, right? So certain technology approaches in quantum require cooling, right? And cryo can be very expensive and it's also the supply chain's a bit challenged right now with some of that tech you just can't build enough of it fast enough right but also if you think about your broadband network that you're talking about you're not going to put cryo everywhere it's just not economically viable it's very expensive it requires a lot of maintenance so you know i, I think um, there is room temperature there's a lot of companies working on room temperature components but it, it's it's early days right i don't think we're going to see something in the next year, but it is important to keep an eye on it. And, you know, some of the questions coming in is, can you mention some of the current prototype quantum networks? You know, I like to mention the one in Chattanooga um, oh, with yeah. EPB, but, you know, we have the Navy Yard and the Brooklyn Navy Yard and, you know, a number of others in DC and so forth. Can you mention some one of them? Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I was gonna bring that up. So, so what's one of the first things you need to do with a, with a brand new, uh, you know, deep tech technology in the hardware side, you need to be able to measure it. You need the metrology, right? You need the, you need that developed. What Qubit Tech and others have done in, in Chattanooga with EPB is fantastic because they've got a they've got a working quantum network with partners. You can come in and you can test your things on that. Uh, and that's great because you can start learning how to use that gear, right? Uh, there is the the uh, Gotham Net that Cubatech and others are are doing, um, you know, in in the Brooklyn area, that's fantastic. <laughs> They're using fiber that's underneath New York, uh, and it's 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 as as the CEO Noel Goddard says, you know, it's it's not the best fiber. It's noisy. It's this and that, but they figured out how to make pass qubits around and use their quantum memory and make all that work. There's also a partnership, and you can go in. We I had one of these quantum marketplaces on uh, quantum networking test beds. And, and we had um, some people that were part of NIST and, and the Defense Department. There, they've got an area, I think it's in the, in the Gaithersburg area, uh, you know, in the East Coast, they have a quantum networking test bed as well. So they can learn and test and build new metrology and, and get that all to work. There's also uh, one of these being built in Sherbrooke in Canada. Uh, these are fundamental, right? Because, you know, the only way you can continue, you know, you can be successful is to be able to measure something and change your manufacturing and R&D techniques so that you make the right product and you build it to spec and everything else, right? You know, I was in um, Berlin a couple weeks ago and the uh, head of the European Commission um, was emphasizing their investment in um, quantum communications and, and quantum infrastructure. And I mean, it seems to me that if you don't aren't investing in quantum networking today, you're going to um, be in trouble fairly soon. You know, Duncan Campbell, uh, Duncan um, had mentioned yeah. that something about Q Day, and he talked about you know how classical networks are protected by public key cryptology, so that public key infrastructure (PKI) is what kind of keeps the internet secure today. But with quantum computers, you know, our classical networks are at risk. And Q-Day is, he said, within three years. And that nation states are working on that and they're not going to be issuing a press release to let us know when they cracked the, uh, you know, the encryption on the internet. Um, so, I mean, when you think about someone like EPB, a utility, I mean, utilities have to protect their critical infrastructure. And so, of course, they'd want encrypted communications, quantum communications, quantum encryption. Uh, how, you know, what what is your advice to operators? I mean, and 
Well, I mean, I think three years is a little early, but it could happen. It's, I think the prevailing theory is more like five to eight, um, but uh, that's why PQC is so important. Um, you know, I think, the, uh, I think there's also a difference between um, what a bank might do on the back end, um, what governments might do with, you know, secure communications um, versus, I mean, what do we all do when we bank? I mean, a lot of us use a smartphone, <laughs> right? You're not going to do, say, quantum entanglement uh, networks with your smartphone, but you, you, you are going to at least use the mathematical uh, hardened uh, algorithms of PQC, right? So, uh, but Duncan's right. I mean, there, you know, there's, there's, there's work being done uh, on QKD. There's work being on distributed entanglement. Um, that's another option down the road. Uh, there's various thoughts on how, how effective that's going to be. Um, but you need to be paying attention to this now. I mean, I, I, I like what, what many others in the space think is, you know, it may not be here tomorrow, but you don't want to be caught off guard like you did like many of us did with chat GPT, right? Um, because this, you know, many companies will take a fast follower approach and say, well, I'm not going to get involved in that until it's real. But then, as you said, you know, you're going to get, at some point you're going to get hacked and you're not going to know it and, and they're not going to say anything. And part of the problem today is you, you hear this analogy of harvest now, decrypt later. So nation states are recording everything on the internet. And as soon as they're able to crack it, they'll go back into those files and crack it, right? So are you one of those people they are paying attention to or not? That's all real. The question is when, right? So you need to pay attention to it now, get involved now, right? Well, you know, this is fascinating. So tell me, you know, when you think about quantum computing, I mean, it really has the potential to really change everything. You know, when you think about drug research, are getting a battery that lasts more than 300 miles. And I mean, some of the, those kind of problems. Can you talk a little bit about how classical networking and quantum networking will work together to be complementary? Well, I mean, we, can, we can go down into the plumbing here a little bit, right? So most of the network runs on, uh, let's say broadband runs on like 1550 wavelengths, right? Um, and some of the quantum companies have realized, well, I don't want to run in the 1550 nanometer region, uh, the C-band, so to speak, because there's amplifiers in there, right? If we talk about longer distances, right? Um, and, you know, so they're going to run in the, some of them are contemplating running in the 1310, 1320 nanometer region, so they don't run into these uh, EDFA amplifiers that destroy their quantum signal, right? But, but for quantum, Networking companies like QNET, Cubitech, and others, they have solutions to work on standard optical fiber that's already laid in the ground, right? So um, they'll just work at slightly different wavelengths or they'll have other mitigation techniques, right? So, um, you know, what I'm curious about though is this hollow core fiber, uh, you know, point that, I mean, Microsoft, Microsoft doesn't make fiber, but they, 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 they bought a company that makes this, what are they going to do with that? Because that would actually benefit broadband uh, by less loss, by less loss in having uh, you know faster networks, but also it benefits quantum because it has less loss. So you need less amplifiers. Like I was reading one paper, you only need three amplifiers to go across the ocean now instead of uh, many more. So there's a lot of implications here. Well, Mark, really appreciate. It. Thanks for sharing your quantum ex expertise and insights with our audience. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and look forward to getting back there next Wednesday. Our guest can be our good friend, Jamie Linderman, the research manager and principal analyst at Omnia, who's going to discuss her latest research on uh, a session titled Forecasting the Future, Fiber Future, an analyst perspective on North American's historic broadband boom. So Jamie has some great new research. Looking forward to that. Mark, thanks again. We'll see you guys next Wednesday.